So let's look at this example. Industrial waste and sewage dumped into our rivers and streams absorb oxygen and thereby reduce the amount of dissolved oxygen available for fish and other forms of aquatic life. Pollution control inspector suspects that a river community was releasing amounts of semi-treated sewage into a river water. To check his theory, he drew five randomly selected specimens of river water at a location above the town and another five below. Assume the population of oxygen levels above the town and the ones for below the town is normally distributed. The dissolved oxygen readings in parts per million are as follows. And then the question is, do the data provide sufficient evidence to indicate that the mean oxygen content below the town is less than the mean oxygen content above? So the first question you have to ask of every problem is, is this a hypothesis test? Is it a confidence interval? Um, then another question you have to ask is, are you doing means or proportions? But let's start with the first question. Is this a hypothesis test or a confidence interval? So when I see the words, do the data provide evidence? This actually says that this is a, a hypothesis test. Hypothesis test asks you to make decisions. So we do know that we have a hypothesis test. So then the question is, are we doing mean or proportion? So then I look around and I notice I see the word mean. So that tells me we're doing a test of mean. Um, the next question is, are they um, one sample or two sample? So I go back up into the problem and I notice it talks about doing five randomly selected specimens above and then five randomly selected below. And it looks like we want to compare above and below. So that kind of says that there's two sample. So we now know we have a two sample test for the mean. Um, if there's two means, then we're actually looking at the test for the difference in means, but we'll look at just the test of the means at the moment. Um, but now the last question is, are they independent samples or dependent? Um, so there's some confusion sometimes on this problem because people think that because it's the same river that they're dependent. But the samples above will have no indication on anything of the samples below. This 48 right here has no bearing on any of the numbers below. They don't actually influence or change probabilities or do anything with the numbers below. You can't even tie them with it. So we would say that this is not a dependent sample, that these are independent. So this is actually a two-sample independent. And we call it a t-test because means are done with the t-distribution. All right, so that got that preliminary work out of the way to figure out what you're going to be doing, what analysis you're going to do. So now the first of every hypothesis test is to state the random variables and the parameters in words. Um, it looks like when he was talking about that they were actually measuring the oxygen level. Um, so we have the oxygen content or level above the town and oxygen content level below the town were both the things that we measure. You're going to call one of them x1, one x2. It doesn't matter which one you call which. Just up to you which one you want to be x1 and which one you want to be x2. Um, because we are dealing with mean oxygen content, then the mean oxygen content above the town is one of my parameters, and the mean oxygen content below the town is the other parameter. If I called oxygen content above the town x1, then u1 has to be the mean oxygen content above the town. And then u2 would be the mean oxygen content below the town. So now we get to the next step where we get to actually write our hypothesis. So, Every hypothesis test has two hypotheses, HO, which is what we assume to be true and hope to show we can reject it, and HA, which is what we're actually asking. So let's go back to the poem. Um, the last sentence does say that do the data provide evidence to indicate the mean oxygen content below the town is less than above the town. So remember, above the town was mu1, below the town was mu2, so we are actually saying that mu1 above the town is greater than mu2 below the town because we want it below the town to be less than above. So there's your HA. HO is always that they equal. Some people like to look at those as a difference. So you can actually rewrite them if you want to by doing just a little bit of algebra. Subtract mu2 from both sides and you get that mu1 is minus mu2 equals 0 for HO and mu1 minus mu2 is greater than 0 for HA, which again really helps to 
illustrate the fact that um, you are looking at less than because if mu1 if mu2 is less than mu1 then mu1 minus mu2 should be positive. Um, the last thing to do is to state your alpha level. This problem does say that it is at the 5% level, so alpha is 0 0.05. Alright, the next step of every hypothesis test is to state and check your assumptions. So we do want to state the assumptions first. So we did have a random sample of five oxygen contents above the town was taken, and a random sample of five oxygen contents below the town was taken. So that's the stating part. We're just stating what's supposed to happen. The check actually says did that happen, and we were told in the problem that both were random samples. So there's your check. Um, the next assumption in a two-sample independent t-test is that the samples themselves are independent. We kind of argue that already. So the stating is just to state that they're independent. Um, the check would actually be to say that they were above and some were below, and one value doesn't affect the other. So they are, in fact, independent. And then the last assumption is that the population of the random variables have to be normally distributed. So the first statement would be the population of all oxygen contents above the town is normally distributed, and the population of all oxygen content below the town is normally distributed. Um, normally you have to check this using um, your assessments for um, normality, such as the normal probability plot or normal quantile plot, the histogram, and the number of outliers, but in this problem we were actually told that the populations are normally distributed. So we don't have to worry about that. All right, so now we've got the first three steps done. The next step is to find the test statistic and the p-value. So what you will need to find is you will need to find the sample mean for your first sample and the sample standard deviation for your first sample, um, and then the same thing for the second sample. It, it turns out that it's... Um, easier just to use technology for these, so I wouldn't do these by hand, but technology actually tells us that the first sample mean is 5, and its standard deviation, which we we'll call S1 because it goes with the first one, is about one, um, 0.158. Um, you also do need to know the sample size. It turns out the first sample was size 5. X2, so the sample mean for the second sample, was 4.86. Its standard deviation was 0 0.114, and its n was also 5, though in an independent test, the n's do not have to be the same. It is better or more robust if they are. So now we have our test statistic. I'm sorry, now we have our sample statistics. Now we can get our test statistic. Um, the formula for this is x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus mu 1 minus mu 2 all over the square root of S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. So we have all the numbers to put in for this, so you just plug in the numbers into your calculator. So 5.00 minus 4.86 would be the subtraction of your sample means. Now we do need to subtract off the population means, and this again is where HO comes into play. So let's go back for just a second and look at HO. HO says, and this is why writing them as a difference is kind of nice, HO says that that difference is zero. Um, and what's really kind of nice is that almost always that's zero. So you actually don't need to worry about that number in almost every problem. This is almost always zero. Then put it over top of the square root of 0 0.158 squared over 5 plus 0 0.114 squared over 5, and you find out that this is approximately equal to 1.607. All right, so now we have our test statistic. We have to get our p-value. To find the p-value, you do need your degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom in a two-sample independent t-test is not very straightforward. Um, my suggestion is to actually do all independent t-tests with technology and not actually use the formula ever, and then the technology will calculate the degrees of freedom for you. But just for one example, I'll show it here. All right, so A and B, and I need to give myself a little bit more space here.
Sorry about that. All right. So A is actually equal to is actually equal to S1 squared over N1. So we know what S1 squared was. It was 1.58 squared over 5. B is S2 squared over N2. And we know what that was. It's 1.14 squared over 5. So A comes out to be approximately 0 0.0049928. And B comes out to be 0 0.0025992. So then you're just sticking all the numbers in. It's a bit of a pain. Oops, I forgot another 9. Apologize for that. My eraser's too big. All right. So 0 0.049928 plus 0 0.0025992 squared over top of 0 0.0049928 squared over top of 4 plus 0 0.0025992 squared also over top of 4. And it turns out that this is about 7.2769. All right, so now to get your p-value. The p-value in this case is the probability of getting a t. We have to decide if it's greater than or less than. So we go back to our hypotheses. And our ha says that it was greater than. So since it was greater than, then our ha um, tells us that our p-value is also greater than. So this would be greater than the number we calculated, which was 1.607. Um, you would use technology to find this. If you're using the TI-83, it would be TCDF. Um, and then 1.607, 1E99. Um, and then your degrees of freedom of 7.2769. Um, if you want to use some other technology, it would just be a different syntax. And it comes out to be 0 0.0752. All right, so now we get to make our conclusion because now we have our p-value. So remember, with a p-value, with a conclusion, is you either reject or fail to reject depending on how your p-value compares to your alpha. In this case, the p-value is greater than our alpha because our alpha was 5.05 .05, and this is 0.07. So since our p-value is greater than our alpha, we actually, in this case, fail to reject HO. So if your p-value is bigger than your alpha, it means you didn't really find the unusual value and you have to fail to reject. So now we get to our interpretation. Since we failed to reject, there is not enough evidence. Remember, we wanted to prove HA was true. Um, but because we failed to reject HO, then, then we did not prove it, so there's not enough evidence to support that the mean, we were hypothesizing that the mean oxygen content above, below the town was less, and so there's not enough evidence to support that the mean oxygen content below the town was less above the town. So unfortunately, this inspector can't prove that the town is dumping um, untreated sewage. They may be still. They may not be, but we have no proof one way or the other. So we can't prove that they are, and that's the end of the problem.